Amen. As they make their way out to their classroom. We, we got a, a special young man here in our church today that uh, he, he loves to listen to his favorite preacher. Did you hear that, Pastor John? His favorite preacher, <laughs> Pastor Grant. And it's his birthday today. Chase, it's your birthday today. <laughs> happy birthday. We want to give you a big shout out and say happy birthday to you. We love you. And we thank God for you. And, uh, and we were on our Good Friday service. We were talking about Jessica Hand and gave a testimony about she got saved on Easter. And, uh, and, and I was going on, and all of a sudden, Chase shouted out there. And I had forgotten that he had gotten baptized on an Easter Sunday. And he was trying to let me know, hey, don't forget me. Don't forget me. And, uh, and we, we are so glad to be able to celebrate your birthday. And, uh, and we're glad to be able to celebrate Life. Life because of who Jesus is. Life because of what he has done. And we get to celebrate that death has no power over those who are in Christ. Amen? Well, I can't preach now because that's gonna, I'm going to steal my thunder for myself. So I've got to get to the uh, passage of Scripture that we read and get to the message then. Amen? You already get the Word of God this morning. They celebrate what Jesus has done. If you would stand with me for the honor of reading God's word. We will be in Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, starting verse 62. And we'll read through in chapter 28. Matthew 27, starting verse 62. The next day, that is the day after preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he had said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that, they had, all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to your word, I pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to believe, a heart to receive, and a will to obey your words today. Help us to see the truth of who you are. Lord, I pray for everyone here this morning, those who know you, that we would be encouraged and strengthened in our faith. And Lord, if there is a man or woman, boy or girl here today that does not know you, they've never recognized who you are as Lord and Savior, that today you'd speak to their heart and that you would reveal to them your truth and they would repent and call upon you for salvation. Lord, I do realize that as a preacher of your word that there is a strict judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word of truth, and I accept that place, for it's in Jesus' name that I pray and his name that I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You may have heard these terms in our culture today. Fake news. Propaganda. Conspiracy theory. Misinformation. 
disinformation. Earlier in the month of January of this year, there was a false report that went out through social media that said the Italian police had arrested the Pope amid a Vatican blackout, and that was widely spread throughout the Internet. The report was posted on a Canadian website, which had so previously posted a fictitious claim that the former U.S. President Barack Obama had been arrested on espionage charges. There's a fake news misinformation report that the French president tweets out a concern about the rainforest fire. And it goes throughout the internet. Fake news. Israeli defense minister says, if Pakistan sends group ground troops into Syria on any pretext, we will destroy this country with a nuclear attack. That's a, that was a fake news. That was misinformation, disinformation that could have possibly had worldwide ramifications. This was the one that I was glad to hear was fake news. U.S. bacon reserves hit 50-year low. <laughs> I am thankful that was fake news, not the truth. There was an article in The Guardian that states that the age of post-truth in these stretches as far back as you care to look, that there has never been a golden age of transparency the ubiquity of fake news and scientific misinformation was already a serious problem for leading thinkers in the Renaissance, such as people like Francis Bacon. In his work, he used the word factitious, which was recorded first in 1624. It comes from a much earlier age of worries about the reliability of information. In 1646, the physician and philosopher Thomas Brown published his Pseudodoxia Epidemica, a title that could be translated as this, an epidemic of fake news. Concerning the vulgar errors and superstitions of the age, among the rogues gallery of mischievous agents of misinformation portrayed are salt and bacos or quack salvers or what we would know today as charlatans. This is the first recorded use in English of the word salt and bako to mean an itinerant charlatan who sold supposed medicines and remedies. The word derives from a Spanish word that means to jump onto a bench as the traveling quack would go around the towns and on the street and they would jump on a bench and claiming that they had all of this medicine, mighty working power to heal people's diseases. The internet has become the biggest bench imaginable of all the charlatans out there trying to put their spin on everything that you can think of. The fact is, is that the Guardian does not go back far enough in the history of fake news. For the scripture that we read this morning was the very first fake news, misinformation, disinformation report on the resurrection. Of course, the chief priest and the Pharisees used the tactic of their father, the devil, who, if we go back all the way to the very beginning, used his spin and used his lies to deceive Eve and made her question, did God really say? The sinister deceit of the serpent can be seen throughout all of history and has found a new platform to spew its poisonous venom in social media. And the snake's power grows stronger and stronger as we search for truth in cracked wells that leave us thirsty. The resurrection story is filled with fake news. It's, it's full of people who try to put their spin on what really happened so that they can deny the reality that Jesus is alive. These Christians, weak-minded, simpletons, who need a crutch to get through life. So proposals and spins of the resurrection are as such it's the swoon theory. 
It's a fake news. It's a, it's a belief that says this, that Jesus, when he was on the cross, he really didn't die. He only appeared to die. Let's ignore the fact that a Roman guard who was trained in execution recognized that he had not died, but that he was taken off the cross, and when he was placed in the cave or in the tomb, the cool, damp air revived or resuscitated his body that only appeared to be dead. And then as he got up, he rolled the massive stone away and snuck by the guards to appear to the disciples as being alive as a victor. Now, one would have to realize that this was a Jesus who had been crucified. Nails put in through his skin, his back beaten, his beard plucked, and, and his head crushed with thorns, and, and he would be bloody. And, and to appear to a room of disciples looking the way he is would be anything less than victorious. Not a conquering king. There's another theory. It's called the misplaced tomb theory that when they went to go anoint the body they went to the wrong tomb now if they had went to the wrong tomb and then they made a claim that Jesus was alive for those who did not believe that and were concerned about that do you not think that a search team would find out and go find the correct tomb and say Here's the body. He, he, he's not alive. But can I tell you, they've been looking for 2,000 years and they still can't find the body because Jesus is alive. He arose. He came out of that tomb on that Sunday morning. The conspiracy theory or the one that is told to us here in Scripture that the Jewish chief priests and leaders concocted uh, the stolen body theory or the conspiracy theory that the disciples stole the body. The great historian, church historian Eusebius, who lived in the 300s, he wrote a little satire of how that conversation might go before the disciples decided to, quote-unquote, steal the body. He says, Let us... Band together to invent all the miracles and resurrection appearances which we never saw and let us carry the sham even to death. Why not die for nothing? Why dislike torture and whipping inflicted for no good reason? Let us go out to all the nations and overthrow their institutions and denounce their gods. And even if we don't convince anybody, at least we'll have the satisfaction of drawing down on ourselves the Punishment of our own deceit. Seems rather foolish, does it not? To steal the body, to claim that he has risen when he had not, and then be put your life on the line to denounce what you would know to be a lie in order to save your life. And so there's always questions of how do I respond to the resurrection story? What do I believe? Who do I believe? And it all goes back to your source of information. Who's more believable? Is it the modern day atheist? Our culture? Our Hollywood movie stars? politicians, philosophers, professors? Who has the truth about what happened to Jesus? Did he rise from the grave? Did he not? Are we right to believe that he rose or are we not? It all goes back, back to our, our source. Now, here's the, here's the thing. I can't do anything. I can't say anything to convince you. I can't make anyone believe you can't make anyone believe when you share the gospel, when you, tell, when, you, when you share the gospel with your friends and when you tell people the gospel story, you can't make somebody believe it. If someone wants to believe the skeptic, if someone wants to believe uh, uh, some misinformation or disinformation, you can't, you can't talk them out of it. There has to be something that clicks inside their mind to where they realize uh, they've been deceived. 
Now, there's three responses to the resurrection that we see, too, here in Matthew. We see that the religious leaders, they were deceptive. They did not believe that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, but yet they believed that their disciples believed that he would rise from the dead. And so, therefore, they wanted to make sure that the disciples wouldn't steal the body and claim that he rose again. And so they, they hired guards to guard the tomb. I always found this interesting that the, the, the religious leaders who hated Jesus believed that the disciples would understand what Jesus taught because he says, did he not taught this, this, this person who spreads these lies, did he not taught, teach that in three days he's going to rise again? And so they thought the disciples are going to steal the body, but yet the disciples are nowhere to be found on the third day. Right? <laughs> They're hiding. They're not around. The women go to the tomb. They encounter the risen Lord, and in Matthew it tells us they fall at his feet and they worship him. They worship Jesus. That's the proper response. That's how we should receive this news, that we fall down on the feet of Jesus and we worship him. The religious leaders deceived. The women worshiped and the disciples doubted. This morning, I don't know everyone's heart here. I know many of you all, and I know many of you all are believers and that you have professed your faith in Jesus. And, and for you today, it's a day of celebration. But there may be some individuals here this morning that are still in doubt. You still wonder if this whole Christian thing is real. Like uh, This whole Jesus getting up out of the, out of the tomb, is that, is that real? Did that really happen? And you may have some doubts, and, and maybe you're on the, er, the verge of being a skeptic or maybe even a critic. But if you, if you doubt, if you, if you have a question about the resurrection, I would tell you this, that, that you find yourself in some good company because the 11 disciples doubted. That might surprise some of you. But if you read Luke, in Luke chapter 24, verse 11, when the women went to tell the disciples that they had seen Jesus and that he was alive, in Luke chapter 24, verse 11, they say this, but these words seem to them like an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Now, I think this is interesting and significant. I think it gives some credibility to the Word of God. Because when you read the Gospels, when the, uh, when, when the men who wrote uh, the Gospels, they did not paint the disciples in a favorable light, did they? They let all the bad stuff come out on them. I mean, really, right? I mean, here, here it is. The disciples? The, the ones that walked with Jesus and saw him perform miracles and heard his teaching, the one that Jesus told them that I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again, they didn't get it. They didn't believe it. Why? Because they were stuck in their Jewish mindset of what the resurrection was going to be. They didn't believe in a bodily resurrection that was going to come at that moment. They were looking forward to the consummation of the ages. Remember when Jesus came to Lazarus and he said, your brother is not dead. I, he, he will live again. And I, oh, I know Jesus he will live again in the resurrection in the future event and Jesus says no I am the resurrection the thought of a body raising from the dead on its own was unfathomable to them they, they didn't believe it they, they were skeptics they were doubters you know, if I was writing, if I was making this story up, right? If they were going to make it up, but this is a made-up story. Don't you think you'd make yourself look a little better than that? Right? You know? Like, and, and, the, and, and the disciple whom Jesus loved, Grant. <laughs> the women came back and said, he is not here, he is risen. And that beloved disciple, Grant, uh, stood up and said, of course he's not in the tomb. He told us he was going to rise again. But they didn't do that. They are doubtful. 
They are skeptical. They, they don't know how, what to make of this. And, then, and then, then, then Luke tells us the encounter that some disciples had with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And, and Jesus appears to these disciples and he strikes up a conversation with them. And then he reveals to them who he is. And those disciples, they're so excited, they're so astounded that they admit the risen Lord that they go and they find the, the, uh, the disciples and they tell them uh, what they have seen. And they're talking about this encounter that they had with Jesus. And then verse 36, it says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. Now, I want you to watch the reaction of the disciples. Watch this. Verse 37. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a Spirit or a ghost or a phantom. They were startled, frightened, thought they'd seen a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? He senses that they're troubled. And why do doubts arise in your heart? See, he senses that they doubt That they don't even believe. I I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that you doubt. Is there anybody watching on Facebook Live that, that you doubt that Jesus really lived? That he really died? And that he really rose again? He says, see my hands and my feet that it is I myself touch me. And see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, they were still overwhelmed. They couldn't understand what they were seeing. He says to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before them. He was proving to them his bodily resurrection, which is a fundamental doctrine in our Christian faith that Jesus just didn't spiritually rise from the grave, but that he physically, he had a bodily resurrection. And because he resurrected from the grave, Paul will say, those of us who are in Christ Jesus, there will be a day when we have a resurrection of our bodies at the second coming of Christ where we will receive a glorified body that will not just be a phantom or a spirit. That's the hope. Verse 44. Notice where he takes them back to. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you While I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. These are the three major divisions of the Hebrew scriptures to a Hebrew Jewish mindset. The law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, that was the entire Old Testament. That was summarized, that's the entire Old Testament. So Jesus says, everything that was written in the Old Testament about me must be fulfilled. He fulfilled that. Now, verse 45, underline this in your Bible. This is the key to receiving Christ as Lord. Then he what? Opened their minds to understand the Scripture. He opened their minds. You see... Those of you who might still be an unbeliever, Satan is trying to blind you from the truth. And what you need right now, and Christian saints begin to pray right now, that if there's anyone here in this room right now that the Holy Spirit is speaking to and he's revealing the truth of who Jesus is to you, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to open up your eyes to the truth of who Jesus is so that you might be saved. Amen? 
So he opened their minds and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. It was spoken of in the Old Testament. This had to happen and it did happen. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. That's the Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, There is nothing I can do to convince you of this truth. There is nothing you can do to convince your friends of this truth. It takes the power of God to open up your mind and to see it. That Jesus is indeed the Son of God. So you have to ask yourself... Who am I listening to? Who's more believable? The Word of God? The men and women who gave their lives for this one simple belief? Jesus has risen. He is Lord. Mark Lowry, he's a Christian singer, songwriter, and comedian. And uh, he tells the story that His mom, when she was alive, she always told him that the silence of Mary at the cross is one of the greatest testimonies of the deity of Christ. Because if anyone knew that Jesus was virgin born, it was Mary. Mary knew. Moms How many of you all, if you had a son who claimed to be God and was being crucified for that claim, would you not scream and shout, I know he ain't God. But Mary was silent. For she knew that Jesus was God. So what do I do when I think about the reality and the truth of who Jesus is? Where do I go for my source of truth and and information? Well, I go back to the cross. I, I go back to the old rugged Roman cross where the bloody beaten body of Christ was nailed and suspended between heaven and earth. I I go back to the cross where the arms of the Savior were stretched out wide and a crown of thorns was crushed on his hallowed head as the crimson blood of a king flowed down like rivers of mercy. I go back to the cross where the sinless Messiah took on the sin of rebellious sinners to bear hell's wrath so that we might gain heaven's reward. Where do I go? I, I go back to the cross where I hear the voice of a compassionate Christ offer forgiveness for the very ones who crucified him and the promise of paradise for the thief beside him. I go back to the cross where the Son of God humbled himself and became obedient to the Father's will and for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame and cried out in victory, it is finished. I go back to that dark Friday where the Father hid his face and the angels sang no song. The sun refused to shine, and the earth began to quake. And the temple was, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. I go back to that sorrowful Saturday where it seemed like all hope was lost and that Christ indeed was dead. To a room full of disciples who are heartbroken 
wondering if their devotion to Christ was all for naught. So where do I go back? I go back to the Easter story. I I go back to Sunday. I go back, I said I go back to Sunday. I go back to the day where the tomb was empty, not because somebody stole the body, but because God raised Jesus from the dead. I go back to Sunday where death was destroyed and hell was defeated and Satan was bound and the power of salvation released. I I go back to Sunday where Jesus rose from the grave and he is alive forevermore and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. I go back to the pages of sacred scripture which tells me of God's amazing love for sinners like you and me. Where do I go back? I'll go back to the source of truth, who is Jesus Christ, our King. And I go back to the basement of a Baptist church in Westwood, Kentucky, where youth leaders were teaching youth how to share the gospel. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave revived my dead heart, opened my blind eyes, and spoke to my deaf ears and said, you know about me, but you don't know me. And that is when I knew then and there, it was a whole different reality of just knowing facts about who Jesus is and actually knowing Jesus personally. It was then and there that I realized that just being in a church didn't mean I was in Christ. That being around believers didn't mean that I was a believer. Oh, I could tell you all the answers I was brought up in Sunday school. So I knew who Jesus was. It was just that I didn't know him personally. And so that night, when the Spirit of God spoke to me and called me out of my sin, and he opened my eyes to his beauty, I called on the name of Jesus that day and I said, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Save me, God. And He saved me that day. He delivered me that day. I was born again that day. The Spirit of God sealed me and He made me a child of God and gave me the promise of heaven that if He comes back, He's going to bring me with Him. And I'm testimony of the resurrection of Jesus today. That he's alive and that he's real. Now, I don't, I don't know where you stand with God. I would anticipate that many of you all are believers. I'd assume that. but I could assume incorrectly. Even some of you who have been in church your whole life, you can very easily play the game of Christianity. It's real simple to do. Show up on Sunday morning, smile, and then have a Bible. And you can be lost without Christ. So I don't know where you stand with God, but but let me ask you this question. If you were to die right now, if today would be your last day, would you go to heaven? If you can't answer that with an emphatic yes, I know I'd go to heaven, I'd make sure I know that before I leave today. I'm going to be standing over here. Pastor John will be here. If you want to pray and talk about salvation, I'd love to pray with you. If you're a believer in Jesus and you want to just come to the altar and celebrate and praise his holy name, feel free to do that too. 
But let's respond this morning as the Holy Spirit speaks. Let's pray. Lord Jesus.